Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the December 2020 meeting of the Naperville Astronomical Association. I am Drew Carhart, the current club president. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're so happy that we're still getting people who are coming online and uh, viewing our really good presentations that we're uh, still providing. If you have any questions this evening, as per usual, uh, the, all this time we've been doing this, if you're following us on Facebook, you can uh, simply put your questions or comments in the comments column. Uh, Jim in the control room is following that and he will be passing those along to uh, our speaker tonight. If you're watching us on the club website or just prefer to use email, if you send the emails to as it says, questions at neighboraster.org. Jim will also uh, follow that feed and pass along things to the speaker. Uh, a couple of the brief notes before our presentation tonight. If uh, you want to view our past programming from this summer, both our monthly meeting presentations, our astronomy fundamentals programs, and a lot of the live streaming events we've been doing, uh, observing events, we've got them on our YouTube channel. And uh, once again, we're hoping we get to the point where we'll get our, a nice short URL for that. But in, in the meantime, the easiest thing to do is just go to YouTube and search for the words Naperville and Astronomy. And uh, there will be up at the top of our channel. We've got uh, over 25 different uh, programs up there now to follow along. On the upcoming events calendar, we have uh, a fundamentals program this month, um, two weeks from tonight, on Tuesday the 15th, and it's going to be on astrophotography with a DSLR camera, the kind of camera that many folks have for doing normal photography. So our presenter, uh, Chris, will be going through the basics of how to do that and get some really nice astrophotos for our January regular meeting program on the first Tuesday of January. That's the fifth. Uh, we have a return engagement. Uh, Larry Bartosek of Bartosek Engineering uh, gave us a presentation earlier this year on uh, the origin of elements, uh, the astronomical origin of the various chemical elements. And he is going to be returning and uh, speaking to us about a project that he helped build some of the equipment for the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey and, and that telescope set up. So that should be a very interesting thing. We'll get firsthand uh, in, uh, explanation of some of the equipment that he helped create for the uh, SDSS. And if you go to our website calendar, as I've been noting, there's a lot less there than there normally would be in the summer and fall, but uh, our upcoming programs are listed there uh, with the dates and, and uh, times as a reminder. And then we're also doing, continuing to do our pop-up events. We did a uh, solar observing event this past Saturday. So we do uh, our observing things when the weather and the sky conditions uh, permit. And we're gonna keep on doing that, but they're not on the calendar generally because we only finalize the plans a day or so in advance of uh, the events. We will advertise them on the club message board for members and on Facebook for uh, all of our public followers out there. This evening, we have a, a longtime NAA member who has given us uh, many wonderful presentations in the past. Uh, Bill Higgins uh, is also a longtime employee at Fermilab, uh, and he is uh, also a tremendous uh, space enthusiast, uh, giving presentations on astronomy and space exploration topics and uh, history topics all around the area and around the globe sometimes. And uh, tonight he's going to be talking to us about the uh, amazing, what was the largest telescope on the planet for quite a number of decades. and. Uh, I'm not going to try to compete with him on the knowledge of that. I'm going to turn the screen over to Bill if he's ready. Thank you, Drew. I'm uh, 
I'm I'm very glad to be here uh, uh, once again, even though this is a here that I've never been to in, in addressing the, the club before. Um, uh, and as always, I'm I'm honored and 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 pleased to be invited to to address the Naperville Astronomical Association because uh, I think this is a wonderful club. I've been a a member for a number of decades, and uh, I, they continue to impress me with their uh, their knowledge of the sky and their enthusiasm for it, and the excellent public service that uh, that that the club uh, um, offers to uh, to the people of our area. Uh, Let's see, I should punch share screen, right? And ask for, ask to look at this thing here, I guess. Yeah. And push this and we should get a, uh, uh, a picture of a telescope. Does that look right? Yes. Okay. So we're look, looking at what we think we ought to be looking at. And I would like to just move that over into this screen on my machine. So I'm looking at what I need to look at and also at the camera. Uh, the uh, topic for tonight is the great telescope of Burr Castle. That, uh, and, uh, and there's a picture of it right here. Uh, a, a, nice, uh, a nice sketch. Uh, uh, looking brown, we'll 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 explain why it looks brown in a little bit. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, I am a I am a volunteer in uh, in the NASA Solar System Ambassadors Program, so uh, so I I agree to to share my knowledge of uh, of of astronomy and spaceflight and related matters with the uh, with the community and. Uh, and NASA periodically gives me briefings on uh, on this sort of thing. Um, the uh, uh, I'm uh, very interested in the history of astronomy, and uh, I have, for your convenience, put everything that's going to be in this talk on one slide to tell you what I plan to tell you. Uh, the um, the telescope in question is uh, is in. Oops, sorry at Burcastle in, in, in Ireland. And the, and the story is that once upon a time, a wealthy Earl loved astronomy. And uh, in Ireland, he learned to make telescopes. And with, uh, with the help of many people, he built a very big telescope at his castle uh, in the 1830s. And then he undertook to build a much bigger telescope in the 1840s. Uh, the Great Telescope saw its first light in 1845, um, and with it, he observed uh, the nebulae and uh, as well as stars and planets. And he became very famous for having a big telescope and also for being an excellent astronomer. Um, his wife uh, got into photography, um, and uh, in the uh, in the 1850s or so, not many people were photographers. Uh, and very few women were. Another of his sons took followed his father's footsteps and continued work, uh, uh, astronomical work. Uh, and uh, his other son became a celebrated engineer uh, for a long time. And the family still lives in the castle uh, several generations later. Um, the uh, the the present Earl of of, of Ross is still there. Uh, the Leviathan, the giant telescope, uh, was uh, um, was superseded by better telescopes and uh, uh, for, for, for astronomical work, and it it got uh, it felt sort of fell into disrepair for 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 a period of I'd say eighty years. But in the nineteen nineties, the people of Ireland decided to restore the telescope, and so it's there. One can go see it. Uh, it has operated, uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, there is a new radio telescope that's operating on the grounds of the of the castle. And I, uh, now as we can see, let's see. Um, here's the laser pointer. I went to see it, 
uh, in the summer of 2019 on a trip to Ireland where I managed to get invited to give a couple other talks. Um, here we go. So here's our man, William Parsons, born in 1800. He, uh, he was part of the aristocracy in Ireland, the third Earl of Ross. And uh, I, as I said, he created two large telescopes and, uh, and, and, and had a very interesting family. The town of Burr is, is kind of small and uh, not particularly close to the larger towns that you've maybe heard of in, in Ireland. It's just, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's uh, in fact, there's, there's not even a train that goes there from Dublin. You gotta take a bus. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, um, William Parsons was, uh, uh, attended Trinity College and, and, uh, and, uh, in Dublin and also went on to study at, at Oxford. He was a member of parliament for quite a while as, uh, as, as, as people in his station of, in life often were. In 1836, he married Mary Field, uh, and uh, who came from a, a, an English family, and uh, and and he, uh, he and his dad died in 1841. So he went from being Lord Oxmantown to inheriting the title of the third Earl of Ross. Uh, in 1845, he was in the House of Lords, and uh, and so you can get some measure of how uh, how much he meant to. Uh, to British science, when I tell you that from 1848 to 1854, he was the president of uh, of the Venerable Royal Society, which is still a leading scientific uh, society. Uh, and he also, uh, near the end of his life, uh, he became the chancellor of the University of Dublin, um, died in, 19, in 1867. So here's uh, Mary Field Parsons uh, took uh, photos uh, often around uh, uh, around the castle and photos of her family, and so here's uh, here's William with a couple of his sons, Randall and uh, and John. Here's where Burr Bur is. Uh, the uh, the the green part is the Republic of Ireland today. The the pink part is uh, is Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom, and. Uh, the uh, the scene of our uh, of our story is is in County Offaly, uh, and the the town is is called Burr. At the time, it was called Parsons Town, um, the, the Parsons family being the uh, the land landowners uh, there. Um, and uh, in 1841, the population was about 6,300, and today it's not really uh, it, it it's about the same size. Uh, uh, there are 5,700 people who live there today. And here's Burr Castle. It, there was historically a castle on this site, and there are some portions of it left that date from the, the 13th century. But really, the structure you're looking at is, uh, is sort of dates mostly from the early, early in the, the 19th century when uh, um, um, Parsons' father and grandfather were were, were expanding this structure and making it a, a really nice home. It's, uh, it's designed to look kind of like, uh, kind of old fashioned, uh, to remind you of the great old castle. So there are crenellations and, uh, and, and, and pointy uh, Gothic arches and such. Um, uh, the grounds of the castle are, uh, are 1200 acres. And uh, so while it's much more like a very nice circa early 1800s mansion than a uh, castle. The, uh, the, 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 the grounds of the castle are also fabulous gardens. It's, <coughs> uh, they, they, there are all kinds of plants. Uh, there, there was uh, one generation of Parsons who were very into botany and particularly planting trees. There's a fabulous collection of trees from uh, sp species from all over the world. And, uh, and they, uh, they share this with the public so we can go there. In fact, uh, um, one, one big selling point for, for, for my family was that my wife loves gardens. She, we were going to Ireland, she wanted to see some gardens. I said, hey, 
I have this astronomy site where the gardens are great. Here's another picture. Uh, a picture we took of, uh, of Burra from our visit uh, here. Um, so you can get some idea of, uh, of the beautiful setting. Um, here's a picture that uh, Mary Parsons took uh, in, in her day of the, the same building. And here's uh, an artist, uh, an Irish artist named Mike Gale, who likes to uh, draw various subjects and, uh, um, and scenes in Ireland and, and so forth. And uh, the, uh, the, the, when, I, when I encountered Mike Gale's art, I decided that I needed to include it. Um, he's done a very nice picture of the, of, of the castle, uh, but uh, he works not with pen and ink but rather with Guinness Stout. So this, uh, uh, th this, this uh, you're looking at a rendering of a great Irish landmark with uh, rich in history, with, uh, with the thing that people most like to drink from the, uh, from the Emerald Isle, Guinness Stout. Uh, a word about Mary, uh, she, was, uh, she came from Yorkshire her uh, her family had uh, very large uh, estates, and uh, and her dad died uh, just the year after they were married. Uh, he died in 1837 uh, uh, or or so, and the uh, that meant Mary and her sister inherited well inherited these estates, and uh, and this caused a. Uh, um, the the Earl of Ross to be who was kind ra rather wealthy by by standards of his uh, of, of of his uh, society to become immensely wealthy uh, and uh, between the rents on the lands in County Offaly and the rents of the, on on these farms back in in, in Yorkshire these people had a very large income uh, she became the mother of uh, of 11 children and sadly only four of them survived to be adults. Uh, uh, she was uh, creative and, uh, and, and not uh, particularly shy about taking up uh, arts that, uh, that, that women didn't usually take up if she was in, got interested in them. So she, she learned to be a blacksmith because she wanted to make uh, uh, beautiful ironwork as they were renovating the castle and, and adding uh, uh, to it, uh, and uh, um, um, uh, Lord Ross got uh, got into uh, photography when it was a brand new um, science, a new, a new technique in the 1840s. Uh, as a scientific guy, he uh, he acquired the equipment and the chemicals, but uh, but he didn't really uh, keep up with this. But it turns out that Mary got took an interest and got her own dark room and, and workshop and, uh, and got very, very good at, uh, at taking photographs and of course uh, developing them and all the things you've got to do uh, in those days. Furthermore, her dark room was, uh, was kind of left intact for many years. So it's, a, it's an excellently preserved example of um, an, an 1850s dark room uh, and uh, the, the tools and, and chemicals are, are now something that, that, that you can visit and they're of great interest to historians of photography. Uh, this is, uh, this slide only, uh, uh, it, it really shouldn't bother you, but, uh, but, but, it, but uh, unless you become a person who wants to do some research into, uh, into this family or these matters, they have lots of names and one must uh, kind of keep track of the confusion because William Parsons has a name, right? He was born William Parsons, but because he has titles, it turns out that the, 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 uh, the oldest heir of the Earl of Ross has the title Lord Oxmantown. And uh, when uh, he inherits the title, he becomes the Earl of Ross. But that mean, means his son becomes Lord Oxmantown. Okay, and uh, if Lord Oxmantown, as, as Lord Oxmantown, William Parsons did important uh, scientific work, and that's the name under which his stuff is, uh, is attributed in the, in the uh, proceedings of the Royal Society, which is fine, but his son 
started using his telescope while his dad was still alive. So Lawrence Parsons uh, was also Lord Oxmantown and his scientific papers shouldn't be confused with his dad's scientific papers, but they're both, both Lord Oxmantown. You gotta, you just gotta keep it straight. Mary Field, of course, uh, uh, was married and, and became Mary Parsons, but uh, she also uh, was uh, the, the Countess uh, Ross. Um, sometimes people, people refer to her as Lady Ross. The town of Burr was historically, uh, in ages past, the town of Burr. Uh, but as the, the, the Parsons town, as the, as the Parsons family became the local nobility uh, somewhere, somewhere around, I guess, the, uh, the 18th century, um, that was, the, the town was, was referred to as Parsons town. And sometimes you hear the telescope uh, uh, referred to as the Leviathan of Parsons town. Uh, and uh, after independence, um, uh, Ireland changed the, the name and the town went back to being Burr. So it's Burr today. Um, uh, Burr Castle is, was, I think, always Burr Castle. Um, uh, the, the county where this is all going on was called Kings County in Parsons time, but later it became known as County Offaly. Uh, the, the local joke in uh, County Offaly is um, it's... Uh, it's given that it's that Burr is very close to the border of this county. It is the one place you might have heard of where it's not a long way to Tipperary. Uh, anyway, the telescope itself, the the the, the family, uh, uh, the the first large telescope is is the three foot telescope, and the the second large telescope is the six foot telescope, describing their their aperture, their, the diameter of their their mirrors. But the uh, the big scope is also is also known as the Great Telescope or the Leviathan of Parsons Town, which is a cool name. And I just wanted to let that uh, <coughs> lay those those historical annoyances out there. Uh, here is my uh, my quick telescopes 101 slide. Uh, <coughs> there are. Uh, uh, for, for, for telescopes that use visible light, for optical telescopes, we, uh, uh, they come in sort of two major flavors. And uh, the, um, the, 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 the one, uh, the sort of, the, the first, I guess the earliest uh, telescopes, the kind that Galileo used, kind of a tube you look through like this, um, are uh, refracting telescopes, refractors. And they use lenses to gather the light. Here's a diagram that shows uh, light coming in and uh, uh, a, a concave lens uh, uh, focusing uh, uh, the light and, and, and making an image out here with this, uh, passing through this other lens. Um, in reflecting telescopes, we instead use a curved mirror to gather the light and uh, and and uh, and maybe some other mirrors to bounce the, the the gather light into a place where a person could put his or her eye or camera or spectroscope, and uh, it is hard to make a very big lens, and so the largest telescopes are uh, are, are are not uh, refractors. Instead, reflectors are the game to be in if you want to uh, have uh, lots of light gathering power and and, and high resolution. Um, <clears throat> the Parsons family engaging uh, in, their, uh, in their telescope building might remind you of a more famous family of telescope uh, makers uh, and, and astronomers, the Herschels of, uh, of England, um, uh, Bath, and that's not the only place that they live, but, but Bath is where you can go see uh, William Herschel's house today. The, um, they, they actually uh, originated in Germany. Uh, William and his sister Carol uh, were Germans. Uh, he was a musician and he came over to England. He got interested in astronomy and started building telescopes and, and came to be an excellent observer and build some of the best telescopes in the world. And uh, Carolyn was his uh, uh, faithful helper and became an accomplished astronomer of herself, herself and uh, is credited with discovering eight uh comets they built uh they built a big uh 
a telescope that was a great workhorse uh, in, in 1783 and, uh, and eventually built a really gargantuan telescope. That, uh, um, the first one was called the 20 foot from its, uh, from its uh, um, focal length, but it had a 19 inch mirror. And the second one had a 48 inch diameter mirror. Um, and uh, the, it's, uh, uh, the, the, and, and the history was made with, with some, of the, uh, some of Herschel's telescopes. He is the guy who discovered uh, the planet Uranus. And uh, in experiments, he was able to, he was the first to discover the existence of infrared light. And he was very interested in the nebulae, the fuzzy objects that are not stars in the sky and what their nature might be. Furthermore, the Herschels had, uh, uh, or, or, or William Herschel and his wife had a son, uh, John Herschel, who became the most distinguished uh, English astronomer of his time uh, and, and carried on work on trying to understand the nebulae with bigger and better telescopes and, and new instruments. Uh, and uh, <coughs> and it, he brought the, uh, the, the 20 footer to, uh, to South Africa and uh, and he mapped, it was the first big, very serious telescope that was able to, uh, to map the objects in the southern sky. So his, uh, his catalog of southern hemisphere nebulae is, uh, is a very important starting point for, uh, for subsequent uh, astronomers. Here's a, here's a sketch he made of the Orion uh, Nebula. Hey, Bill, uh, we have a Facebook question. Yes. Do you know how the telescope got its name, Leviathan? Leviathan? Or Leviathan, sorry. I think it's just a very large biblical monster. And uh, when in, I, in looking for a suitable name to call a very big, uh, very impressive telescope, someone, I'm not quite sure who, settled on Le Leviathan. I don't think Lord Ross called it Leviathan. Okay, thank you. Well, as I say, um, William Parsons got interested as, as a young man in, uh, in astronomy. Uh, he was always uh, uh, good at astronomy and, and, and mathematics. And um, he decided that the key to doing better astronomy was to make better telescopes. And he got interested in telescope building. And, uh, and in, in, in the 1820s, published some of his uh, experiments uh, with making a better mirror for reflecting telescope. He, uh, he made a six-incher in 1826 and uh, a 15-incher in, in 1830. Um, he try, making bigger and bigger mirrors is not, uh, not easy, so uh, he needed to develop uh, the techniques, and uh, he experimented with uh, making maybe uh, uh, make, making mirrors as, as wedge-shaped things. Uh, uh, can, does this zoom in thing? Yeah, okay. Or, uh, uh, or, or making or metal thing that has a compartmented structure to, to keep the, uh, the, the mirror stiff uh, um, and, and so forth. Um, and how does one zoom out of this thing? There, okay. Uh, he uh, experimented with different alloys to make metal mirrors out of, um, and uh, the, the, the so-called speculum metal alloys of, of copper and tin. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The, he invented a, 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 a grinding and polishing machine to, to uh, make the surface of, of, uh, of, of excellent mirrors. Uh, uh, grinding and polishing a mirror is very, very tedious and very labor intensive. He invented a machine that could be powered by steam. Because we're in the 19th century now. Uh, high technology. Uh, he was ready to undertake a, a, a really big telescope by the 1830s. And he spent several years uh, try, trying to cast a, a good three foot mirror and, uh, and got pretty good at it. And, uh, um, I guess that makes it 0.91 meters, and uh, it saw its first light in 1839. The mount for this telescope is a lot like uh, William Herschel's telescopes. Uh, there's uh, it can go up or it, it, sorry, it can be pointed 
in, in elevation up or, or down. The whole thing is on a turntable. So this whole structure can be um, rotated uh, to, so that this can, this can point and, uh, and move uh, um, east and west. Uh, and you can see some kind of a stair arrangement so the observer can get into a cage to, to, to get in a position to look in the, uh, in, in the eyepiece, which is up at the, the front end of the telescope here. Um, and, uh, it, <laughs> and, and when this thing is at a very high elevation, you're very high off the ground and it's a, a little scary. Um, uh, here's a nice picture by, uh, I guess this is an engraving that's stolen from a, that, that's, that's copied from a painting by, by Henrietta Crompton, who is another cousin of the, of the many talented uh, Parsons family. And it's a, it's a nice uh, kind of uh, bucolic uh, image of the, uh, the, the three foot uh, telescope and uh, long, tall ladders. And, uh, it was, uh, it was some distance from, from the castle, as you can see. The, 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 the three-foot telescope did some, some great astronomy over the years. Um, and uh, um, uh, William's son, uh, Lawrence, the fourth Earl, uh, uh, gave the telescope a, a, a makeover and put it on an equatorial mount in the, uh, in the 1870s. So, so it, um, in, uh, in that era, this is, this is what it looked like instead. Um, uh, to, uh, to accomplish these, these large projects, uh, Lord Ross uh, had a workshop that, uh, that he built and staffed with uh, workmen, uh, people who were the artisans from, from Burr. Nobody in Burr knew any more to, about how to build a, a precision instrument and exotic telescope than, than, than Ross did when he started. But uh, he took, uh, you know, bricklayers and, uh, and, and carpenters and trained them uh, to, in, in, in what he wanted. And they became uh, an excellent team that worked together for years to, uh, to produce these things. It, the, you'd think that uh, a wealthy Earl who had to uh, entertain a lot of important people in his very, very nice mansion, mansion might build a workshop on the grounds some distance from, uh, from, from the mansion, but no, he wanted the workshop to be very close so he could dash down in, when he was in the middle of some paperwork or whatever, he could dash down for the day and check on, uh, uh, for a moment and check on how the workmen were doing or, you know, undertake a project and then go back and, you know, be correspond with parliament or, or the Royal Society or whatever. So uh, I, I, I imagine that having a, a, a forge and, uh, and a, and a, steam engine doing polishing and who knows what other kinds of uh, mechanical uh, actions might have made uh, a, a fair amount of smoke and maybe a lot of noise. But uh, the family uh, put up with it for the sake of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of science. And uh, this is a color image uh, of watercolor that Henry Crompton did that I found a, a somewhat uh, more expansive picture of the same painting, but it's, uh, but it's larger and it gives you a little more context. And you can see that next next house um, and, uh, and various kinds of apparatus here in the, in the yard. I said we were making mirrors out of speculum metal. It's a, uh, it's an alloy of uh, of, of tin and copper. And according to my dictionary, that's, that's called bronze. Uh, and uh, you want a, uh, a mirror to be shiny because it's a reflecting telescope, but you also want a mirror to be strong and, uh, and keep its shape and, uh, and, and, and survive the, the, the process of casting and making it. And, uh, so there's a, a mixture of uh, is a mixture of, of of tin and copper basically means that if you put more tin in it, it reflects better, so it's more shiny. But but if there's tin, in, the more tin there is in the mixture, the more brittle this is, and the mirror becomes a fragile thing that might break 
when it cools down and coming out of the mold when you're uh, you're casting it. Uh, either way, uh, copper and tan is going to gradually tarnish, especially in a humid environment, and uh, and uh, the middle of Ireland is not a dry environment. So the, uh, the Ross, as I said, did lots of uh, of of experimenting over the years with uh, with the way to do these things, and he he found his optimal proportion compromise between strength and uh, and uh, and reflectivity would be uh, thirty two parts copper, uh, fourteen point seven parts of tin, and the key step is to cool the mirror very slowly in the mold after pouring. So you've, you've heated up your mold and your, uh, and your, and your metal and you pour the metal in, you're, you're not done. You're nowhere near done. You want to keep that hot and only very gradually over days, sometimes weeks, reduce the temperature until at last you have a room temperature thing. That's uh, that's a satisfactory mirror. Uh, as for the tarnishing problem, uh, the, the best solution was to make two mirrors or maybe more than two mirrors and just uh, use it for a while. And as it got more uh, more cloudy and less good at being a telescope mirror, you and your workmen would take it out and uh, and take it back to the workshop and polish it. And if you have a second mirror, you swap it out and, and have another shiny mirror ready to go so you could do more astronomy while the repolishing of the second uh, speculum was uh, was underway. Uh, the, uh, for, for, for the biggest, uh, mirror, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the 1840s, uh, telescope, the six footer, uh, here's the arrangement for, uh, for pouring the speculum metal. And they had to pour five of these guys till they, uh, till they, they got it right until they got two that were, that were good because they're, um, you know, accidents and mistakes that can befall even skillful people as they uh, as they attempt to do this they they had a <coughs> a, uh, a a a a set of furnaces where which would uh which, which could heat three uh crucibles of uh, of of liquid uh uh speculum metal at once and an arrangement of cranes that could take these hot liquid uh, crucibles out and and position them around the big mold where the, the for the for the telescope mirror um well this was all cast in one piece even though he'd experimented with wedge shaped segments uh it turns out doing it in one piece was uh, was the most satisfactory way and uh poor it, it, the poor happened in a few minutes and then uh, the whole uh, the the mold would be rolled into a building that was uh, it was itself kind of a furnace or a you know a a, a cooling house that uh, an annealing oven where the, uh, the where there there are fires burning and the whole thing could could be pretty much kept at a temperature very near the uh, the, the melting temperature when they where they put when they poured it and gradually reduced over weeks in uh, in temperature um but uh, you have to keep feeding those fires uh and uh this being ireland you fed the fires with peat with turf now a, a, a distinguished astronomer and mathematician t romney Rob robinson a uh, friend of the family and a person who wound up often observing with uh, ross's telescopes uh robinson was uh, was the uh, the director of the Armagh Observatory up north, but uh, but he frequently visited Burr, and he was there on the night of the 13th of April, 1842, to watch one of these uh, mirrors be poured, and he wrote a beautiful description of it, which I, I'd like to share with you. The sublime beauty can never be forgotten by those who were so fortunate as to be present above the sky crowded with stars and illuminated by a most brilliant moon seemed to look down auspiciously on their work. Below, the furnaces poured out huge columns of nearly monochromatic yellow flame and the ignited crucibles during their passage through the air were fountains of red light producing on the towers of the castle and the foliage of the trees such accidents of color and shade 
as might almost transport your fancy to the planets of a contrasted double star. Just like in Star Wars, just like at the beginning of Star Wars, right? Uh, nor was the perfect order and arrangement of everything less striking. Each possible contingency had been foreseen, each detail carefully rehearsed, and the workmen executed their orders with a silent and unerring obedience worthy of the calm and provident self-possession in which they were given. Um, it's, you know, this, this puts you there. I really like this. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, after that beautiful description, we would, well, we, I could say we would have a mirror, but actually, as you know, it has to be in the annealing oven for a good long time. And then you have to keep feeding it uh, um, peat, right? So the fires keep going. But a few weeks later, and after burning 2,000 cubic feet of turf, this is the result. This is, uh, this is the only surviving uh, uh, mirror of uh, Lord Ross's. And, uh, and there's a kindly person on Wikipedia who, uh, who uh, let us use this, uh, this picture. And uh, it's in the Science Museum in London, because unfortunately, um, the, the London museums eventually get all the good stuff. Uh, um, in, uh, uh, and it's, it is not, not in Ireland, but the Science Museum does take good care of it. It was moved there uh, around the turn of the last century. So we have a Facebook question. Yes. Uh, Steve asks, what kind of grinding materials was used to grind the metal? Oh, wow. Um, I don't think I have that level, that detail in my head. I'm going to show you the, a diagram here of the, of the machine that, that did it. Um, and, uh, but, uh, uh, there's, uh, but I, I don't offhand, uh, know that. Sorry. Okay. Um, the, here is, uh, here is the, the, the steam powered grinding machine. It, it doubled it. It, 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 it was used for the grinding stage and then with a, a different uh, head on it, sort of for the, for the polishing stage. And if we look down on it, it looks like this. And if we look at it from the side, it looks like this. The, um, uh, the, the, the mirror is here near the center of the picture. Uh, and there is a tool um, suspended uh, by various uh, on various arms and driven by uh, by 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 rods and 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 belts uh, running around pulleys in a certain motion. So this uh, th this tool is uh, is is turning, uh, but it is also moving to and fro because there's an eccentric uh, wheel uh, driven by this pulley. Uh, making this rod move back and forth. So it moves back and forth and back and forth across the mirror, but there is another eccentric drive with it making a slower movement at right, right angles. And the combination of this stroke and this slower side to side stroke and a very slow rotation of the whole, uh, uh, of the whole mirror was calculated to be the kind of action that one would need to wear down the metal uh, surface into um, the, the right kind of parabolic shape. And uh, when uh, the grinding of the surface got to be uh, the, 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 the shape people wanted, then, uh, then it would, the, the grinding tool would be replaced with polishing tool and, uh, and uh, I imagine something like jeweler's grit. Um, uh, and in, in, in the way that uh, mirror, mirrors have been made for a long time and, uh, and everything's got, you know, water uh, um, um, flushing, uh, uh, flushing through it and keeping everything cool and so forth. Um, and, uh, but uh, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it, it was, Kind of revolutionary for uh, for the making of big mirrors, for sure. So the telescope was finally finished in 1845 with uh, a couple of mirrors. 
the, uh, as they said, they were six feet in diameter. The tube is 58 feet long. And uh, the mounting of it is, uh, it ma makes it easy to move in, uh, in azimuth here, I guess. And uh, only a very limited amount of travel east and west, as, as we'll see. Um, uh, Mary Ross had a hand in making uh, uh, stone walls for this structure or designing what stone walls should look like uh, so that they kind of were in harmony with the architecture of, uh, of the castle and other buildings on the, on the grounds. Um, the, uh, the Herschels had these giant wooden frameworks for their telescopes and so did the first uh, uh, Ross telescope, the three-footer. But there was something called the Great Wind of 1839, which was a tremendous hurricane that uh, devastated uh, uh, all kinds of stuff uh, all over Ireland, in particular killed a few people in, in, in Burr. Um, and uh, so for, the, for, for, for his masterpiece, uh, uh, Lord Ross wanted his... Uh, his telescope they have a very very sturdy mount, mounting and he built this kind of a uh, fortress to uh, to hold it uh, and there's a complex system of stairs and rails and a, a kind of elevator that for placing the observer at the eyepiece um, we'll see some details of that here's what it looks like when i visited it uh the telescope barrel is here uh it's, uh, it's between these two big stone walls and here's part of the, the wooden arrangement of, uh, of stairs and rails uh, uh, that surround it. Um, when it gets up to a really high uh, azimuth, then the observer will be up here and uh, there's a walkway and uh, so that, that you could uh, you know, visit it in any position and uh, an arrangement to move, uh, move, move the observer um, back and forth uh, to this thing. And, and there's some supports here for, for counterweights and such, and everything runs on good uh, 19, here's, here's the, uh, uh, let's see here. This looks to the south. Uh, and so this, I guess, is the north end here, uh, or you could see the rear end, you could see the, the telescope now from behind, and you could see a kind of square wooden box, black box at the, at the end that would be the, uh, the box that holds the, the main mirror. Um, here is a, uh, a really fine picture that I often saw reproduced in, when I, as I was researching this. Uh, cousin uh, Henrietta Crompton uh, did, did uh, nice watercolor pictures of the grounds and, uh, and here she has the castle and that picture I was showing you earlier of that view of the uh, of the the three foot telescope right here on its uh, on its revolving uh, carriage <coughs> and uh, and the magnificent stone walls of uh, the Leviathans uh, mounting here it's uh, it's mounted straight up because some people are changing out the mirror and uh, you can see that they've put the speculum on uh, on this cart here. There's a lot of workmen uh, 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 pushing it around, um, and a guy working a windlass, and uh, and uh, someone in a top hat telling them what to do. So that's presumably the Earl himself. Uh, here's a diagram made by uh, by the. the Contemporary engineer, or, or, sorry, our, our modern engineer, Mike, Michael Tuberty, a uh, structural engineer from Dublin, who was in charge of restoring uh, the telescope, and uh, and it shows you kind of uh, how how the uh, something about how the mechanism uh, uh, travels. We uh, the the telescope barrel is here, and the mirror box is here, and uh, it would uh, it would ride uh, along the the or, or there are, there are Parts of parts of the telescope that would ride along the meridian arc. So, so this iron rail kind of shows you the the the, the path of its uh, of its travel as it would elevate. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the there's an eyepiece right at the end here, and a sort of wooden cage that the observer would be in. And there's a very clever arrangement for making this cage 
ride uh, pretty high up uh, along the wooden rails in the front of this uh, of this uh, uh, thing. And uh, as I said, the observer would switch from that cage uh, when the, when the telescope was was high enough into uh, into an arrangement to to work along the the top of the of the stone walls. Um, there's a windlass driving all of this stuff here, um, and so forth. Some some counterweights that make the whole thing work. Notice that it says universal joint right here. Okay, so it, it's a nice drawing. Uh, Michael Tuberty wrote a little book that explaining the project, and uh, he uh, uh, he uh, was. Uh, I was sort of surprised to find that he is not only a distinguished structural engineer from Dublin, but in his youth he was a distinguished uh, musician, and uh, and uh, you could see him playing the flute here. Uh, he's also a a, a a dance instructor and. Um, and uh, and a, a figure on the folk music scene. In fact, he was uh, one of the original members of the Chieftains, so a, a rather famous uh, Irish uh, traditional music band. So if you've listened to the Tree Chieftains, maybe you've listened to Michael Tuberty, but uh, but he can uh, he can, you know, play in your band or fix your telescope or teach you how to do the, the old dances. Um, talented guy. Um, so moving in elevation, as I said, oh, the, the, here's a little diagram that just shows the telescope uh, moving from, from one elevation to another with, let's see what we can see here. Um, uh, the, with the, the, the cage, the observer's bridge sort of riding up along with the, the, the telescope. The, the universal joint down here at the bottom is what allows the telescope to travel side to side about 10 degrees either way. So to track a celestial object as the earth rotates and, and, and watch it move from east to west, you, you get your crew. It took about four people to observe with this thing. You get your crew to, uh, to move you uh, from side to side and the, the travel is quite limited, but, uh, but, but the telescope's not, as you might guess at first glance, just restricted to staring at the, at the meridian. So big cast iron universal joint, bunch of people hanging around the, the mirror box. Uh, if you want to know, see what some of the, the people who, uh, who worked on this uh, looked like. Unfortunately, I don't have the names of the gents in this, uh, in this picture, but it took a, 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 a serious team, not only to make this uh, telescope with all the skills required, but also to, uh, to observe with it. Bill, we have a Facebook question. Yes. What was the optical tube assembly? What's the uh, what's that made out of? Uh, it's made of wood. Mm, let's see. Where's a? This is. I bet I could zoom in on this guy a little bit. See this? Uh, see this black uh, cylinder here? Is uh, uh, the, you can see hints that it's uh, it's made of boards. It's really a barrel. It's the barrel of the telescope, right? Uh, but it's, it's made of wood. Um, and uh, it turns out that the only place where they could get a, I, I think, I think it, this is a story about the restoration of the telescope, but the only place they could get uh, somebody to make a wooden cylinder that large and completely uh, weather tight was the Guinness factory. So they got the folks who make barrels at Guinness and, and, and big wooden vats to make the telescope tube and then uh, you know float it on a barge or something and 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 uh, truck it to timber. I hope that answers the question. Uh, this uh, slide just shows you some details of the uh, of the the mechanism, the meridian arc, uh, counterweight and 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 pulleys here. Uh, And uh, you know some twigs and and such uh, growing in here, and an occasional bird nesting in it. There's some flowers growing here and there. Uh, here's a nice view of the the front end of the telescope, including the uh, the the bit where the observer uh, uh, uses the eyepiece right here. The 
uh, it's usually it usually has a cover. At the time that I visited um, the telescope, there was a problem with with there had been a problem for for a year or more with uh, with the chains supporting the telescope, and they were no longer safe to operate. So it was kind of semi permanently in the down uh, position. But from about 1998, I think, uh, until the just a few years ago, this thing regularly operated and 21st century people could could go look at the sky in the way that Lord Ross had. Here's here's a, a glimpse of the uh, of the the bridge here and uh, a a somewhat better view of uh, of the wooden structure that runs across the whole the width of the whole uh, of the whole uh, fortress and uh, and that is a wedge shaped uh, wooden structure that moves as the telescope moves uh, in uh, in elevation. Uh, Bill, another Facebook question. Uh, so Steve asks, with the tube fixed to the local meridian and little east-west movement, how long? Do you know how long uh, he could keep an object in the field of view? Um, the sky moves fifteen degrees an hour at the equator, right? So uh, if if I haven't gotten this wrong, I would say that you could probably keep an object for. You could keep looking at an object for a little more than an hour. That the total movement is the total travel is is twenty degrees. And uh, is that uh, is that better at higher latitudes? I guess no. It's probably about the same. Uh, no. Okay. It's it, it's improved. Longer times at, at higher celestial latitudes. But, uh, um, you know, you're, it, the, the, he was definitely making uh, compromises in order to get the design, you know, get, get, get everything wanted out of this design. And uh, it's much nicer to have a telescope you can put point in any direction, any, anywhere, anytime you want. But this thing has to wait until the thing you want to look at is within that narrow wedge of sky that the telescope can see. Um, so um, it's, uh, it can't look at anything in the sky at, a, at any night. We have one more question. Uh, Jim asks, what was the reflectivity of the mirror? If you took into account, if you took it into account, what would be the diameter of an equivalent perfectly reflecting mirror? So, I guess he's basically saying, with such poor materials, would a would a nice, you know, two foot telescope have a just as good a view? Um, yeah, that that's a that that question is on the right mental track. There's uh, there 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 is it's it's really good the day you get it out of the shop and get the the workers to install it in the telescope. And then over weeks, it gets poorer and poorer. I don't really know any, I can't give you any numbers on this, but it reflects less and less well. And that's in terms of light collecting capacity, that, uh, that, that is like getting the mirror to be a smaller and smaller mirror. I think that, uh, that so, you know, you can have another shiny mirror anytime you want to take the time and trouble and labor to swap in the second speculum, right? Uh, so it's really kind of a, a compromise where, where I'm sure Lord Ross would decide uh, how often to swap mirrors and, and go through that hassle. Uh, as we'll see, there are, there are other hassles in life that, uh, that came up that made this, uh, made this difficult. But, uh, but yeah, it's, I, he probably never got it. It, it, it left to himself, if he had a choice, <clears throat> probably didn't let it get so bad that it was like a, a two-foot telescope. Um, but, uh, but, but you have the right idea. It's going to degrade, and, it, and the degrade is, if, in, in terms of get, light gathering power, if, if not resolution, the degradation is like uh, um, 
is, is like getting a smaller and smaller mirror. Uh, some more views of uh, the, uh, let's see, the, like the, the steps here that uh, actually, you know, observer wouldn't really go up these steps usually, they, they, you know, or, or, they, or, or maybe they would, I guess, in order to get to whatever position the bridge was in. You can get a, a glimpse of the up, upstairs structure here for, for high uh, elevations. And, uh, um, and that, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a mechanism Kind of hang up off to the side here for uh, for the uh, for this bridge to be moved back and forth. Let's see. Here are the people uh, once again on engraving based on Crompton's painting of uh, uh, a little bit of close up detail of uh, of the guys working on the, the specula. Well, what did Lord Ross see? Uh, when he uh, when he got to use this first light, 1845, for at least a few months uh, um, in, you know, waiting for the Irish weather to clear occasionally. Uh, he was very interested in the nebulae, and he hoped that he could answer the question of whether the fuzzy objects here and there in the sky that, uh, that Mr. Messier had cataloged and that had intrigued uh, astronomers, uh, um, for a long time as telescopes got better and better. Uh, there was an argument about whether these were really inherently cloudy things or maybe really large, really far away things that were that looked fuzzy but were actually made of lots of individual stars. And if you want to settle that question and you want to hope to say, ah, oh, we can resolve them into individual stars, then what you need is an even, you know, is a very, as big a telescope as you can, a, a major aperture. So he hoped to see more detail than, uh, than he saw, than, 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 than astronomers had previously seen. Here is uh, John Herschel's catalog um, using the 19 inch uh, telescope. Uh, Herschel had done an excellent catalog of the nebulae and a 19 inch telescope sees quite a bit of detail in objects uh, fuzzy objects like Messier 51, and this is how uh, Herschel drew uh, uh, Messier 51. M51 has, uh, it, it, it's at least two bright objects, and, and one, one is big and one is small, and the, uh, the, the bigger one seems to have some kind of structure uh, in it, but this is the limit of what one can make out with the, at that aperture. So here's what Lord Ross saw when he looked at it with the six-foot telescope much more detail, uh, uh, a bright thing and uh, another bright thing, one small, one large. But these things that, uh, that Herschel drew, drew kind of a overlapping circles turned out to be um, a, a something, a, a spiral, a, a series of spiral arms kind of uh, emanating from this, uh, from the big bright thing. And uh, one of the spiral arms seems to reach to the little bright thing, and uh, and he uh, he is the guy who decided to call this the Whirlpool Nebula, uh, and uh, Lord, and and so M um, fifty one is is not just uh, uh, the uh, um, you know, the a major discovery of uh, of Lord Ross, but M fifty one is kind of the spirit animal animal of the town of Burr, and they have gardens and sculptures and stuff in the shape of spirals to uh, uh, to remind everybody of, of the discovery of the spiral galaxy. If you compare this drawing of Messier 51 uh, with, uh, with a modern picture like the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, you can see, well, you know, modern telescopes can see even more detail, but you could be kind of impressed with how accurate that drawing is and how much he was able to capture with uh, state-of-the-art 1840s uh, uh, instrument. Bill, we have two two more questions. You're getting a lot of questions tonight. That's okay. That's a good thing. Um, Ken asked, "What kind of eyepieces did he have, and and who made them? Did he make them himself?" 
Wow. Um, I don't see. I. There are a lot of people in the audience who know a lot about telescopes. And so I bravely charged in here, even though I knew there are people smarter than me in the audience. Um, I have books that answer those questions. I don't happen to know uh, much detail about his eyepieces. Okay. I think um, that uh, that some of his instruments uh, were made by uh, by Charles Grubb, in the Dublin uh, instrument maker. So maybe they were Grubb eyepieces. I don't. Uh, I don't really think Lord Ross made his own eyepieces, because uh, you know that's uh, the eyepiece would have been a set of lenses, uh, and uh, and there were. Um, eyepieces about this big. I uh, I have a picture of one somewhere, but I didn't put it in the uh, in the slideshow, and uh, and so that kind of good instrument could be, you know, could be built by good instrument makers. Um, uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't an, an extraordinary thing that you have to make yourself. What else you got? Okay, and then Bill uh, Bill Purdue asks, um, how did they test the mirror? Uh, what was the the focal test in use at the time? Uh, once again, I am not smart enough to answer that one competently. Um, although I have encountered it in my reading. They, uh, they had a, was it maybe a knife edge test? Uh, they, they had tests that they, they, they had a, a setup in the, in the workshop or uh, outside the workshop where they could set up the mirror looking straight up and, and you know, climb a tower and have uh, uh, um, and, and make make measurements on the mirror. But I can't uh, the, aside from that vague answer, I really can't uh, can't tell you. OK, and we got one more. Um, uh, Jim asks, I'm curious what motivated him to carry out uh, his expensive research. Did he say explicitly what it was? It's so foreign to how we think of research funding or wealthy people doing their own big research today. Um, was he just curious about astronomy or did he have some yeah, other? He was, uh, he, he was, he, he learned enough about astronomy in the 1820s to, to, you know, to be a professional level, although there weren't many paid professional astronomers. That wasn't, that wasn't a job. Very many people had it at that time. Uh, but he, uh, he had the education and he had the, the, the contacts to be part of the astronomical community and to publish, uh, you know, telescope making uh, techniques. And he was uh, different from other big time telescope builders in, in, in the, in that he, he was uh, proud of sharing everything that he learned, uh, uh, and he was very interested in in making sure that other people could use the techniques that he had uh, that he had worked out. Um, so there's there's a fair amount of detail in his publications about uh, 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 about just the the steps, which is sadly I haven't absorbed it all. So which is one reason I'm kind of got a bald spot on these questions. Okay, and then uh, one more. I think this is probably an easy one for you. So after it tarnished, would he just recast the mirror, or would he clean it? He'd he'd, he'd repolish it. Uh, so it would it would go back and be resurfaced. That's uh, kind of why he had two, right? He always had one being repolished while the other was in use. Right. You could imagine that three might be useful or something, but uh, but he, uh, as far as I know, there were two for this. Uh, for this telescope, we uh, and the the second one is lost. It it might be one one thing I learned about Ireland is that uh, um, the museums are mostly full of things that were accidentally or deliberately thrown into peat bogs because uh, the bogs are great at preserving clothing, wood, bodies, whatever you know. And uh, so if you want. To save something for posterity, throw it in a bog in Ireland. So maybe, maybe the last speculum is in a bog. I don't know. Um, I am really getting off the rails here. <laughs> okay, well, that's all the questions. Uh, yeah, 
And so, I've come I've well, come to one of the sad parts because uh, 1845, when 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 a person who knows Irish history thinks of 1845, that person probably doesn't think of oh that's when the telescope started up. Uh, the 1845 was the first year of the infamous potato famine. There, there was a crop, a failure of the potato crops, and Ireland had over the last centuries made great use of the potato, and it had been uh, very productively fed, uh, a, a fed the population, and people had come to depend, be, be very dependent on potatoes. And if the potato crop failed, uh, suddenly there were a whole lot of people without food and without income, and uh, and the uh, the crop failure persisted, and, and 1846 was terrible, and 1847 was terrible, and Ireland was in uh, a tragic uh, downward spiral uh, that uh, that you know, the effects of which are, are still felt uh, today in in Ireland and and indeed you know all over the world because so many Irish left and move to the British Isles or Canada or emigrated to America. And, you know, America and Australia and a whole lot of other countries are, you know, very dependent for uh, uh, a bunch of Irish people showing up later in the 19th century and, and, and taking part in their own histories. Uh, but from the view from Burr is that, uh, is that this uh, the wealthiest guy in town who was also had a lot of civic responsibilities as a, a magistrate and the commander of the militia and so forth suddenly found that he the you know his 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 tenants and 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 the people in his community dependent on him were in big big trouble he got very involved in relief work uh and really for several years had practically no time to do astronomy. Um, uh, he, uh, they, the, what the Ross family decided to do was to employ people to build improvements to, to their estate. So uh, they, uh, they, they built a, a new keep gate for the, for the castle. There was a stable block building there. They enlarge, had people enlarge the lake. They, uh, they and 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 lots of other kind of civil improvements, which kept uh, a lot of laborers uh, working and uh, and gave them some income to try to uh, try to stay alive and and, and take care of their families. Um, and and uh, it was uh, it was a uh, it was a tough time, of course. And I I my, I don't have words to do justice to that uh, to that era, but. You know, it affected my ancestors as well as, uh, as well as, uh, you know, everybody else in Ireland. Now, I'm going to turn to talking about uh, about William Parsons' son Lawrence uh, a little bit. His name is spelled both Lawrence with a W and Lawrence with a U in different sources. So I've I've chosen W here. Uh, he would eventually go on to become the fourth Earl of Ross when his dad died. But of course, he was Lord Oxman Town before that, right? Uh, and is uh, and and he uh, he was very interested in astronomy, and he continued his father's work, uh, the, uh, observing, uh, developing telescope technology some more. Uh, he uh, he he did a definitive paper on the Orion Nebula and and and, and other catalog, uh, catalogs of, of other nebulae. He. Uh, uh, he was particularly interested in the moon uh, and observing the moon with uh, with with both of the the telescopes uh, at uh, at Burr. Um, so here's a uh, as, as just a little sample. Here's a, a sketch of Jupiter uh, uh, that he a couple sketches of Jupiter he made in in 1872 and uh, some details of uh, of the moon, but uh, Lord's Crater over here, and Aristarchus and Herodotus uh, here, uh, you know, standing at the telescope, and with your pencil box and your, your sketch box. And there's a little little uh, desk or board there to rest this stuff on and make your drawings. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the when we come to the moon, 
uh, Lawrence Parsons' most famous uh, accomplishment was that he figured out a way to determine the temperature of the moons. He, uh, he attached this specialized uh, device, really a telescope in itself, I guess, uh, uh, to the, uh, the three-foot telescope. And it had a set of uh, thermocouples, uh, and uh, and and one of the tele one of the thermocouples was exposed to light from the 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 moon, and the other one was staring at basically the dark sky. So while neither one of these things was very good at giving you an absolute measurement of the uh, of uh, the temperature of the sky coming through, the tiny difference between them was a measurement <coughs> that would tell you something about you know the we don't know the absolute temperature of the moon but it is this many degrees hotter than the dark sky and uh this was the first time that anyone was able to use uh infrared light and make uh make make such a measurement uh the lunar people been looking there's all kinds of optical measurements you can make of the moon and uh, sketches you can make and and uh and, and so forth but but uh Taking the temperature tells you one more thing about the properties of the moon that you can't find out anywhere else, and it can help constrain uh, theories in, in the emerging astrophysics of the 19th century. Uh, and that instrument is in the museum at Bur. There's a really excellent science center, in case I didn't say that, at Burcastle. And uh, and so if you the the, the history and the gadgets and uh, the log books and the drawings are uh, are on display for uh, for you to uh, appreciate. Uh, Mom's dark room, Lady Russ's uh, dark room, and so forth. Uh, now Lawrence's younger brother, uh, Sir Charles Parsons was the one who uh, who became an engineer and he got into the design of dynamos and uh and 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 steam powered equipment and he invented a thing called the steam turbine which may very well be providing the electricity that's powering my my lights and and computer right here and now uh spin uh, uh, Turns out a spinning wheel is uh, is a much more efficient way of harnessing the power of steam than a uh, than a uh, you know a still cylinder steam cylinder cylinder type steam engine ever was uh, if you designed the turbine right. And he also got into uh, uh, optical equipment and founded uh, a company called C A Parsons and Company, which uh, which still exists as a division of Siemens. And I cannot resist telling you about uh, Sir Charles' attempt to, build, to apply the steam turbine and uh, the way, uh, the, the power that it harnesses to marine propulsion, because he thought that you could drive ships with a turbine type engine. And he built a, uh, a yacht, uh, a, a modest sized ship he called the Turbinia. Uh, it is the first vessel powered by a steam Turbine launched in 1894, and uh, it was the fastest ship afloat. It could go 34 and a half knots or 64 kilometers an hour. Um, and uh, he tried to sell it to the British Navy. The Royal Navy, uh, you know, you think they would like a really fast uh, ship, a way to drive uh, drive ships in a new uh, new more efficient manner but they weren't very interested and they didn't want to buy his uh, thing and then it came time that there was a i believe the 50th anniversary of of queen victoria's coronation and it was a big deal and there were celebrations all year long by various uh various people uh around the uh the empire and the royal navy was having a special review of all their greatest uh, ships at uh, at Spithead and in in 1897 so um uh sir charles asked if he could maybe have his uh you know show off his new ship at uh during this uh, navy review and uh, the naval official said no you can't sorry it's our the, the you're not you're not allowed and uh, but when the day came and the mighty ships of the Royal Navy were parading past uh, the the Prince of Wales and the Queen, um, uh, another ship showed up. The Turbinia showed up and started going, you know, 
barging into the parade and weaving in and out among the other ships. And this was not allowed, and it was a bad thing. So the Royal Navy started to chase uh, the, the Turbinia, but it turns out that they could not possibly catch the Turbinia because it was far faster, as I said, than the other ships. So um, it wasn't really long after that the Royal Navy decided to buy turbine-powered ships. Uh, here's a cousin, uh, Mary uh, King Ward, uh, a cousin of William Parsons, uh, who uh, was a, a woman involved in, uh, in, in writing about science and in, in, in research uh, with microscopes and, 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 and telescopes. And, uh, and she made uh, wonderful uh, books. Here's a, a portrait that, uh, that Mary Parsons uh, shot of her. The, she's, uh, looking, she's, she's got contemplating a, a spectroscope, you know, optical uh, gadget, uh, uh, big and, uh, in the 19th century. And here's uh, an example of uh, Mary Ward's uh, microscope book, uh, which has recently appeared in a new edition. And just a little glimpse of some of her, uh, of some of her sketches of, uh, cells and feathers, insect parts, and, and so forth. Um, it is uh, sad to say that uh, she uh, she died in an accident that uh, that's uh, that unfor that unfortunately was a consequence of her inventive family that they had they had devised uh, so, some of uh, 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 the, the the Earl of Ross's sons had devised a uh, uh, a steam powered uh, carriage and uh, uh, and she was riding in it when it uh, it uh, took a corner a little too fast and tipped over and, and, and killed her. Uh, so she is uh, remembered as the first victim of an auto accident. Uh, um, but so another sad moment in the talk, but uh, but she's uh, she's uh, her her science is uh, is still, as I say, still in print, and uh, and she's still revered as a uh, an important woman of nineteenth century science. the The telescope, F, F, the third Earl and the fourth Earl did lots of astronomical work, but this telescope was uh, was awkward and took a lot of uh, of effort to keep uh, to keep using. There were several uh, assistants employed as sort of a high level astronomers and several workers employed to, you know, haul on the windlass and so forth uh, to, uh, to do astronomy at Burr. But uh, over the decades, uh, this thing became sort of less and less uh, practical. It wasn't really practical. <coughs> now, the family was into photography very early on, right? So they must have dreamed constantly and had constant discussions and, uh, of, of what if we could put a camera on our telescope and get a photo of the sky, but that's just not practical for, uh, for a, a telescope that's, uh, that's sort of guided by hand and for the kind of photographic apparatus that was available in the 1850s. It just would take, indeed, far, they, they could take pictures of very bright things pretty well if they had a long exposure time and everybody sat very still. But the, uh, but, but taking pictures of the faint stuff in the sky was just beyond the technology of the time. And astrophotography got developed eventually, but after, you know, another generation or two of, uh, of, of development of photography, but uh, it really was not, not, not made for the, uh, for the, the Leviathan to, uh, to use uh, um, astrophotography. And we could say similar things about spectroscopy. I, I think they, they experimented a little bit with it, but but the spectroscope wasn't really very productive to use uh, either with this telescope. So it fell out of use. And uh, by, oh, you know, the end of the 19th century, they weren't using it at all. And, uh, and it was kind of left to uh, uh, get kind of sadder and sadder. Uh, now, people who knew the history of this thought that was a shame and here's a, a shot from a TV show uh, in 1967 where Sir Patrick Moore, the famous television astronomer who was on 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 the BBC like forever, uh, went uh, was was interviewing uh, the sixth Earl of Ross, Michael Parsons, and uh, and he, Moore always wanted 
the all he thought that people should fix up the telescope and restore it to its uh, to its former glory because it was a great story and a great accomplishment. And uh, it took a long time, but in the 1990s, this actually happened, and Moore was still around or to uh, to to help uh, spearhead the the fundraising drive and uh, and the, the the civic effort to uh, to bring back the uh, the Leviathan. The uh, the mirror, as I said, was in the Science Museum in London, so they decided to make a new aluminum mirror for this, which is a, a more practical thing and doesn't uh, doesn't tarnish uh, uh, easily. And, uh, and as I said, that worked uh, quite well for uh, for most of a couple of decades. And there's hope uh, that uh, once they get it fixed up, it will be back in operation again. Now, I have a Facebook question. And this this goes back a couple slides, but um, and I don't remember which uh, Earl it was that measured the temperature of the moon. Uh, Matt asks how how could he read out thermal couples? I didn't realize technology tech, that technology was that old. Uh, yeah, I I can't I can't tell you much about the history of thermal couples, but. Uh... But he was doing this stuff in like I think the 1860s or so, um, and uh, there's a nice well. So you're you the, the thermocouples can be part of a circuit where uh, where you're making a delicate balance in voltage between one thermocouple and another, and you know some perhaps something like a variable resistor in the circuit, you can imagine. So you try to make the balance perfect by, and, and make some needle go to zero by the setting on your precision resistor. Or some, get, some, some arrangement like that. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't not, not really familiar with the, the apparatus at that, uh, at that level. Uh, but so thermocouples, you know, part of the the, the electrical the, the part of the many electrical discoveries uh, throughout the 19th century, people kind of gradually got a handle on electricity and how it's made and how it connects to magnetism and what's going on inside a battery, really, and uh, and and so forth. And uh, discovering that there are uh, there are that electricity depends on thermal effects and that different metals have uh, um, a, a, a connection of two different metals can, can, uh, can make a voltage depending on, how, that depends on uh, what, what temperature they're exposed to. Um, that was the key to, to this. And, you know, I, I imagine that precision laboratory thermocouples were probably fairly well developed by the time Sir Lawrence decided to take them up. Can't can't tell you more than that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the only question we have right now. All right. Uh, the uh, I I I wish to bring you news now of uh, of this uh, new telescope that in the last decade has started operating at uh, at, at Burr on the grounds uh, near where the sheep graze. Uh, uh, the, uh, the there is a radio telescope called or a radio telescope array called uh, LOFAR, the Low Frequency Array, and uh, it got it's an international cooperative effort that got started uh, with with some arrays first built in in, uh, in the Netherlands, but have uh, have now stations all over Europe, and uh, and they've added one in Ireland, so that puts on. Um, extra uh, arm on uh, uh, the, these. Okay, so these little dots are, are the locations of different stations. There's a bunch of Dutch stations, but there are some in uh, France and Germany and Italy, as you can see. Um, and uh, one in England and one at Burr. And each of these dots is only, you know, a modest low frequency uh, telescope. Actually, there are two different kinds of uh, of, of radio gathering uh, widgets uh, involved in each of these 
stations uh, sort of in, in two different sort of frequency bands that they that they study. Um, but uh, the magic is in the, taking the signals from multiple stations and combining them with a horrendous amount of mathematics in a computer to uh, to to crunch and and tell you what uh, what we can learn about the signals if we put together station A and station B in uh, in the arrangement that we call an interferometer. Uh, so uh, I we, we we took a tour and he and and, and there were a couple of uh, astrophysics students uh, working there for the summer when uh, when we got there. Here's Jeremy Rigney, who's now in a, a PhD program, and and Jane Dooley and. Uh, they uh, they had to give tours twice a day, explaining to the public, okay, we're going to walk down here, down this beautiful trail, through the gardens, past the, you know, away. The first they would show people the Great Leviathan, and then they would walk, you know, some distance through a beautiful landscape to get to the uh, uh, the Lofar array, or uh, the Irish station in the Lofar array is called I hyphen Lofar, as you see. And they would have to not only explain the telescope, the, the great telescope, but also explain along the way along this path what radio astronomy is, what a radio telescope is, something about radio interferometry and how you do it, and the kinds of things that a radio telescope looks at and the kind of things they help study. Um, solar physics, uh, pulsar emissions, uh, all kinds of phenomena. Uh, and and Getting that into people in like a half hour talk on a, a short tour, that's a tough job. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I would, it would be a challenge for me to do it. So I sort of admired the work they were doing. The, uh, the, uh, a 19, or an 18th century building here that used to be a shed where the milkmaids worked and, and milked the cows has been turned into an ast astronomical education center. Uh, and, uh, also houses some of the equipment that does the, the processing uh, for the array. And the array doesn't look like much. The In the foreground, we can see some things that are covered with uh, black tarps, but under there is uh, there's some frameworks that uh, the hold just the right kind of antenna to, to, do, to synthesize a nice array. And in the back, you can kind of see poking up some grayish looking uh, aerials that are, that are longer and taller and, and give you uh, uh, the signals, and I'm not going to go into this in, in a lot of detail, but it's really cool that that uh, that Burr is yet again, you know, has once again become a place where they're doing some cutting edge astronomy, and it's one more reason to be interested in uh, in, in in going there and, f and and an opportunity to educate uh, uh, visitors, students from all over Ireland and so forth to. Uh, uh, and you know it, it's a hook to uh, to have a science center, so uh, so it's a it's a it's a great place to visit. Uh, my my wife uh, who who likes science just fine, but also loves gardens. She said we should go back. She we, she liked it so much. She said, Let's go back tomorrow and uh, and go there some more. So we spent two whole days going around the gardens and uh, and and looking at the science and the history and and so forth. And it was really, really a great time. So if you ever have a chance to go somewhere near the town of Burr, you should go there. And uh, that is pretty much what I have to say. Are there any more questions? Uh, wasn't there a, a cousin named Alan Parsons and he had uh, some kind of project? I don't know about his projects. <laughs> it's a joke. There's yeah, a band okay. called Alan Parson Project. Alan Parson Project. Yes. Baby boomers will understand this. Sure. I think that is all the questions we have. I don't know if let's give it just a couple seconds and see if anybody else brings anything yeah. in. Otherwise, Drew, are you there to come back on? Yes, I'm here. Um <laughs> Thanks much, Bill. Uh, let's get us out of plain space here. Um, I think we're ready to adjourn for the evening. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. And we hope you will join us again in the future. <laughs>